when we say the word sphinx, we're actually speaking the ancient Egyptian language because sphinx is a corruption through Greek, Greek of the ancient Egyptian phrase sheshep ankh. And sheshep ankh means living image, living image. But the question is, whose living image does the sphinx represent? Egyptologists think they know the answer to this question. And their theory about who the sphinx represents and about the age of the sphinx, their opinion on this matter, is falsely presented as fact in all our textbooks and all our encyclopedias. You look up the Sphinx of Egypt in the Encyclopedia Britannica or any other text of that nature, and you'll be told, without any question mark over the matter, that it was built by the Pharaoh Khafre in his own image in around 2500 BC. And yet, the Great Sphinx like the pyramids, is an entirely anonymous monument. And since it's carved from raw stone, we have no objective way of dating it. What we're dealing with, with that attribution to Khafre, is purely and simply Egyptological opinion. And as Robert and I have gone on with our work uh, into Giza and into the monuments of Giza, we have come to trust Egyptological opinion on these matters less and less. In fact, we don't think that the Egyptological opinion on these matters is right at all. We think the Egyptologists have got it totally and utterly wrong. Perhaps you agree with us, perhaps you don't. But one thing is for sure. It's very bad scholarship that the opinion of scholars should be presented as fact when it isn't fact. Let's see what the Egyptological opinion about the identification of the Sphinx really rests on. One thing it rests on is the face of the Sphinx. Egyptologists tell us that this anonymous monument looks like Khafre. And they say that because there are a few statues of Khafre that have survived which actually have Khafre's name on them. And so they compare the face of the Sphinx with the face of a known statue of Khafre, like this one, which is in the Cairo Museum. And they tell us that the two faces are identical. Well, we don't see it that way. We don't think that the two faces look similar at all. We think they look very different. But don't take our word for it. And don't take the word of Egyptologists for it. The person who really is an authority on faces is somebody like a police forensic artist, somebody who's made a lifetime study of the similarities and differences between faces. And back in the early 1990s, colleagues of ours, led by John Anthony West, brought a police forensic artist to Giza, Lieutenant Frank Domingo of the New York Police Department, with 20 years on the force. And he did a very careful point-by-point -point identikit comparison of the face of the Sphinx and the face of Khafre. And here are some of his drawings. What he concluded is that he just couldn't understand why Egyptologists were under the impression that the Sphinx looked like Khafre. He saw no resemblance between the two faces at all. And when he compared key angles of the faces, he concluded, he swore an affidavit to this effect, that uh, whoever the great Sphinx's face represents, it certainly does not represent the face of Khafre. The angles of the face are completely different. And he, in fact, concluded that the great Sphinx represented an individual of an entirely different race from Khafre. OK, so that dismisses the facial similarity view that Egyptologists wish to foist on us. What else do they base their attribution of the Sphinx to Khafre on? They tell us that there are certain texts around Giza which say that the Sphinx was built by Khafre. Let's look briefly into this issue. Let's start with a text that was found at Giza which says very definitely that the Sphinx was not built by Khafre. This is the so-called inventory stella, which stands neglected in a corner of the Cairo Museum today. According to Egyptologists, the inventory stella is a work of fiction. It's an ancient Egyptian novel, which we have to ignore. And why do we have to ignore it? The reason we have to ignore it is because it doesn't fit their theory. The inventory stella tells us that the Sphinx was already standing and already remotely ancient when Khufu, the predecessor of Khafre, came to the throne. And if the inventory stella is correct, then the Egyptologist must be wrong and Khafre could not have built the Sphinx. But, say the Egyptologists, the inventory stella 
doesn't date from the same period as the Sphinx, and this is true. The inventory stella dates from about 1,200 years after the orthodox dating for the Sphinx. The orthodox dating for the Sphinx is 2,500 BC, and this stella belongs to the period of 1,200 BC, or perhaps a little bit later. Uh, they say, since it's not contemporary with the Sphinx, we don't need to pay attention to it. But yet, with that amazing double standard for which uh, Egyptologists are the, the world uh, leaders. Uh, they base their attribution of the Sphinx to Kafra on another piece of text, which also is not contemporary with the Sphinx, and in which, in fact, dates from the same period as the inventory stella. They base the attribution of the Sphinx to Kafra on this stella, which is called the Dream Stella. Uh, and it was put up by Pharaoh Thutmosis IV to commemorate a restoration campaign that he undertook on the Sphinx. And on this stella, amongst many other interesting texts which Robert will review, there is one single syllable, kaf. And because of that single syllable and nothing else, the monument is attributed to Kafre by Egyptologists. They wish us to believe that Thutmosis was telling us that Khafre had built the Sphinx, that he was commemorating the building of the Sphinx by Khafre. He might equally well have been telling us that Khafre was an earlier restorer of the Sphinx, or he might not have been referring to Khafre at all, because it's just a single syllable Kaf. So, on such flimsy foundations, perhaps the most important monument of the ancient world has been attributed for the last century or so to a particular pharaoh in a particular epoch. We think that it's vastly, vastly older than that. And I'm not going to go into the details of that. Robert will give all the details in his talk on Keeper of Genesis. But what I will briefly mention is the geology. Between 1991 and 1993, the Sphinx was studied by Professor Robert Schock of Boston University, a leading geologist and one of the world's recognized specialists in the weathering of limestone. And uh, he was brought to the site by our colleague John Anthony West, who had noticed these curious erosional features on the side of the Sphinx, and uh, particularly prominently on the trench of bedrock out of which the Sphinx is cut, which obviously was made at the same time as the Sphinx. These undulating, this undulating profile, this scalloped undulating profile, and these vertical fissures that run down through the rock could not have been caused by sand erosion, and they could not have been caused by wind erosion. They could only have been caused by one thing, and that is exposure to a very, very, very long period of heavy rainfall. And Professor Robert Schock has put his reputation on the line, and he's subsequently been endorsed in this matter by hundreds of fellow geologists and opposed by very few when he says that what we're looking at on the Sphinx, these, by the way, are later restoration blocks, what we're looking at on the Sphinx and on the surrounding trench is classic precipitation-induced weathering. The problem is that in 2500 BC, when the Sphinx is supposed to have been built, Egypt was as bone dry as it is today. The climate conditions did not exist then, and they have not existed since, to cause this kind of weathering around the Sphinx. The last time that sufficient rains fell in the eastern Sahara to have caused such weathering when the Sahara Desert was still green was around the end of the last ice age, focusing us back again towards that period, that mysterious period when the ice age came suddenly to an end around 12,000 years ago. 